Welcome to Agile Witness News. I'm Agile Bill Krebs, and I'm pleased today to have Kenny Rubin with us. Kenny is a certified Scrum trainer um, and a former managing director of the Scrum Alliance. He's taught over 18,000 people, including um, in over 200 companies, some of those in the Fortune Top 20. Scrum is a technique for project management or agile project management, often used for software development, but I think it applies beyond software. Uh, Kenny, you've done so much really interesting stuff. I wanted to highlight a few of your initiatives that you've done to help the agile community. I also wanted to get an update on, on some of the things you've been up to. Uh, but first, could you tell us a little bit uh, more about yourself? Thanks, Bill. Yes, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, so, my background is software engineering. My degrees are all in computer science, but I've, I've taken always the unusual path. So, when I first came out of school, I, I went to work for a, a company called Park Play Systems, which was the early market object technology leader that we brought small talk out of the research labs at Xerox Park. And, and in those days, I was an engineer, and I also became the training and, and consulting department. And so, my my transition through my career has always been engineer first, then I became trainer, coach, um, and from there I became VP of uh, project manager, VP of engineering at several companies. Uh, I've worked at seven different startup companies. I uh, had the good fortune of taking two of them public on the NASDAQ, uh, in the last one back in the crazy times of uh, 2000. Uh, and so I've helped raise $150 million in venture capital funding through all of that. <laughs> uh, I know, it's, uh, it, it, was a, it was a crazy ride. Uh, and you know, so I've had my share of you know, big companies and small. I spent two years with IBM where I was a director in a group where we had 130 people that would run around the country doing large distributed object systems using small talk back in the mid-1990s. Excellent. And so I've been using Agile since the early 1990s and Scrum formally since 2000 um, when I was working at a company called Genomica and when the VP of engineering got let go, I was... Uh, given the responsibility for the 90-person engineering team. And that was the first time I worked with Scrum. And it worked out rather well for us, and, we've, and I've been using Scrum ever since. Wow, that's way cool. That's, that's inspiring. Um, well, you know, you did mention Smalltalk, and um, that's one of the cool programming languages. Um, do you feel there's a connection between Smalltalk and some of the roots of Agile? There, there certainly is. And it's probably going to be helpful to... Um, remind everybody what small talk is. I was teaching a class last week and I introduced that you know, I had, uh, was an early small talker and, and I had a bunch of blank stares. Uh, but I was dealing with a, a much younger crowd. Uh, so just to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, small talk uh, in the 1970s was developed. It's a, it's a programming environment. So it's a, a language, a class library, a set of tools. It was developed at uh, the rather famous Xerox Palo Alto Research Center in, uh, in California. And, and it stayed within Xerox for you know, the better part of a decade, uh, actually longer than that. Uh, in 1988, I was pretty fortunate to, to join this company, Park Play Systems. And I mentioned I was in charge of uh, training and consulting at the time. This was a spinoff of the Xerox Park Labs, and it was there to bring small talk, to bring object technology into the marketplace. And so we, we used it to build a lot of interesting systems in, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Now, I think by the, first, by the time the first Scrum project was done, which was 1993, uh, Smalltalk had already been rather well established as a very powerful way of developing software systems. And so the first Scrum project was actually 1993 at Easel Corporation and a fellow by the name of Jess Sutherland who was the, the chief engineer at Easel, he and his team were on a small talk development effort, and they were trying to create an object-oriented analysis and design tool. Uh, their goal was to really find a better way to explore, excuse me, exploit object-oriented technology, and that's really what gave rise to Scrum. So uh, Sutherland actually is quoted as saying things like, you know, Scrum was originally designed to support emerging object technology environments. Uh, now, at the time, small talk was really a game changer I mean, for the first, imagine like for the first time, you have this seamless environment that has this pure object-oriented language, this class library, and this set of tools, uh, and you could actually go off and be very agile at a technical level. 
this is rather, rather key. Uh, in fact, most of today's object-oriented languages and IDEs are all based on Smalltalk. They have their origins that they can trace back right to the Smalltalk environment. And, and so if, if you think about it, what makes this really interesting is that Smalltalk actually gave rise to two things, both Scrum and extreme programming. Hmm. Now, uh, for people who are familiar with extreme programming, uh, its origins really are from Scrum development. Kent Beck, who himself was you know, an awesome small talk developer, a world-class small talk developer, the ideas that are in extreme programming had been in use for many years by small talk programmers. When, when Kent finally organized it all together into a concept he refers to as extreme programming. So small talk spawned the technical practices that are part of extreme programming, but the it, did small talk and its technical abilities generated a need for more agile way of sort of managing and organizing the overall flow of the work, and that gave rise to Scrum. So in a sense, small talk is the origin of both Scrum and extreme programming. And so it's interesting to kind of see how the history all ties together. Well, that's fascinating. Well, you look way too young to remember that, but I, I actually remember some of that in the industry. Of course, you know, I was an APL guy, but <laughs> I had friends that were doing small talk in, those, uh, in the 90s. And so that's fun to hear those connections. You know, sometimes people think it's 2001, Agile Manifesto. And I actually had some Agile stuff going on even before that, didn't you? Oh, we, we did. And, and the, the 2001 meeting in Snowbird was just a continuation of a series of meetings that had happened over the years. I'd been to most of the earlier ones, happened not to go in 2001, mm -hmm. to where, the, where the manifesto was defined. Uh, but we used to call them the work, they were called WOOD, the Workshop on Object-Oriented Design. Nice. And so almost all the original signatures uh, of the Agile Manifesto uh, come from the object technology world. M a lot of them small talk, some of them from others, other object-oriented approaches. But um, it, was the, it was object technology that really gave rise to Agile, the need for Agile techniques. And, and as I said, also extreme programming. That's cool. Yeah, that was very exciting times. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you know, I picked up a copy of your book, uh, Essential Scrum, and I found it to be uh, really good. I've enjoyed it a lot. Uh, not only is it packed full of good, yeah. Well, th you're welcome. Not only is it full of packed full of good, you know, meat. But I like the illustrations. I noticed you uh, took particular care to design a whole system of graphical icons for the Scrum process. But I just wanted to, you know, hear a little bit from you about uh, about your book. Well, I appreciate that, and, and yeah, it, I think the the visual agile lexicon, as it's called, uh, which is really this visual agile language. You know, evolved out of the work I was doing in my training classes. I, I wanted to have this uh, icon, iconic language that would describe Agile and Scrum, and it would allow me to compose these really powerful three-dimensional looking graphical representations of core Agile concepts and roles. You know, so things like the, the core roles, the artifacts, the activities that were taking place, and, and at the time there was a lot of sort of one-off pictures you could find. You know, if you sort of surf the web, you'd mm -hmm. find interesting pictures. And there was nothing wrong with the pictures, but they're, if you tried to compose a full presentation from the pictures, it, it looked like a mismatch because you were getting different pictures from different sources. And, and most of the more popular versions of, of uh, the Scrum framework diagrams uh, were really missing some important things like sprint review, sprint retrospective weren't in there. So I decided that I would just go ahead and create my own language uh, for graphically describing you know, what, what Agile and Scrum are all about. And so when I began to write the Essential Scrum book, uh, the creation of the language was underway, but it really accelerated things in the high gear for me. Um, so right, so the, the book itself uh, took the better part of three years to write, and the creation of the visual Agile lexicon uh, probably was half the effort. I, I would often work on the, the pictures first. Right, and then write after I had the pictures because I really wanted to. I needed the book to be appealing to everybody. I wanted it to appeal to members of the development team, you know, uh, technical, hands-on individuals, but I also wanted it to appeal to managers. And, and we all appreciate pictures. And so, in, in a 400-page book, I have over 200 pictures. Wow. So the goal, the goal was almost every other page, you would have a picture. And not just you know, in a, a high-quality three-dimensional picture that really could express the the intent. Uh, the only downside is it's hard to make an audio book out of my book because <laughs> it's it's got so many pictures in it. Uh, but yeah, sorry. It's so when someone looks at the book, uh, almost always the comments I get is, "Wow, this really does a great job describing Scrum, and the pictures are just you know great." Uh, and, and just so people know, the 
I, I make all the pictures in the book available for free to anybody who wants them. Uh, they just can go to my website at Innolution.com and click on a, a, a no-cost license agreement, and uh, you can download all the pictures that are in the book, but you actually can get the four color, color versions. The book is only printed two color. Okay. Well, I really like that. I did notice that because uh, uh, I was working with some Agile coaching, and we were struggling over our diagrams. And you, uh, endless debate, right? And if I could just point to you as an authority, it says, look, you've already thought about it. It's, it's actually quite useful. So thank you for sharing that with the community. You know, that's very helpful. I'm happy to do so. To, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I checked the other day. There's already over 50 people who have uh, taken out a license to it. So, and there's more every day. Um, who, who knows? Maybe it'll become the de facto way for representing it. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> it could be good. Okay. Well, I'm going to stretch my legs here for a second and uh, in our um, uh, virtual campus and uh, see what other topics we want to uh, uh, discuss with you. Um, so I'll just stand up here and. Uh, uh, we already talked about uh, your small talk career, which which I found uh, quite interesting. And then um, the next thing I want to highlight is comparative agility survey. I know you worked with Mike Cohn on that a little bit, uh, who another cool agile fellow. Um, now I liked it, you know, the metrics and data, but I, I thought maybe you could um, tell us a bit about that. The thing I noticed is um, some of the data you presented a few years back said that teams that had more experience with agile. Uh, dug more into the practice, had more success at the two-year mark. Uh, less than six months, some of them were struggling. But this uh, data was from a while ago, so I just wanted to uh, see what kind of thoughts you had on the topic now. Uh, great question. So comparative agility, just so everybody knows, this, this is a project that I started with Mike Cohn about three years ago. Uh, and the issue was really quite simple. We in our coaching, we would go into companies, and frequently the question we would get from somebody like a CIO would be, how are we doing? You know, we're, we're spending a lot of money on this agile adoption, and I kind of like to know how we're doing. And, and the question was really focused on how are we doing relative to others who are trying to do similar things? They weren't really asking for something like, hey, on a, like a CMMI uh, maturity scale, where are we? Are we three, four, or five? because um, I don't believe that such a scale exists, right? There's no such thing as I have achieved agility, right? I'm at level five. Uh, agile isn't something you become. It's something you become more of. Mm -hmm. It's like every, every day I want to get more flexible. I will never achieve flexible. I will simply become more flexible. I like I keep that. Stretching. So what we decided was we really needed a comparative instrument. And, and I had such a thing when I was at IBM. We used to do client server studies in the mid-1990s. And, and, and we would work with CIOs, and IBM had access to them. And they really wanted to know, how do I benchmark against other people? Because you, know, you don't want to go to a bank that has 10,000 employees and say to them, well, you know, you're know, you a little behind that uh, five-person web startup firm. That doesn't really matter to them. And so what we did is we created a survey. So comparative agility is a survey instrument. And the idea, and it's actually a second generation instrument. The first version of the survey had about 120 questions. And people would go, it would take you know, 30, 40 minutes, they would fill out the questionnaire. And what would happen was we would then generate a report that would compare their results to the other people who had taken the survey. So if they just did it individually, they would get compared against the entire database, which today has just shy of 6,300 surveys. So nice. it is by far the largest collection of Agile-related data in the industry today. Well, what we would do with it, so we, after getting several thousand surveys in there, uh, we actually went ahead and did a project, uh, the goal of which was to analyze the data. And by doing so, uh, to identify whether there was any questions that we could simply eliminate. And through that process, we actually cut it back down to about 85 questions for Generation 2. And so what I have is a bunch of data in this database that when people take surveys, they can get compared against either all of it or a subset. So a bank can say, only compare me against other banks that have been doing Agile for at least two years, and how am I comparing against them? So in, in the, the data you originally saw, we were trying to in a sense, give her a report of the state of the industry. Mm -hmm. And so at a conference, at one of the Agile conferences, they gave a presentation where the goal was really to go into that kind of detail. And so I, the picture that we're looking at uh, was generated uh, today out of the database. And, and so I have the ability to go in, and what you're seeing is the different dimensions along which we compare agility, so teamwork, requirements, 
planning, technical practices, quality, culture, and so on, and, and outcomes. Outcomes is really the business outcome. And this is for the entire database. So I ran a report saying, show me how the industry as a whole has answered these questions. And so under teamwork, there's multiple different characteristics, and each characteristic of a team has different questions. So within these different dimensions you're seeing here are the 80 different questions, and they're all rolled up. And the way you would read this, I'll simplify it. The black line that you'll see in the picture uh, represents the average of how the industry answered. And you notice the scale is one to five. Mm -hmm. uh, and our, our, the questions can be answered along uh, a scale that says true, more true than false, neither true nor false, more false than true, and false. That's how you get the five items on the scale. So one would be false and a five would be true. Mm -hmm. And so when you see things like teamwork, where the black line is almost on four, that says that as an industry, the uh, the industry believes that most of the, when uh, when it came to teamwork, how agile are they on a teamwork level dimension? They're on average more true than false. Okay. And as you look at the lines, what you'll notice is the one that scores the lowest for the industry is technical practices. Mm. And, and so technical practices looks like it's a you know a three and a quarter. Right, so nearly neutral, meaning neither true nor false, meaning a lot of teams today that are doing Agile still don't do very well on technical practices. So we can kind of see where the industry thinks it's at, and this is the, the, the most granular of all the, the different diagrams that we can get. Um, I won't go into all the details here, but the bars in the picture represent standard deviations from the mean. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see at the bottom it'll say like one standard, you know, minus one standard deviation, minus two. So the spread, you know, the how long the bars are actually give you an indication of how variable the answers were in the industry. So there's actually quite a bit of data in comparative agility. And in, in fact, I'll be giving um, a keynote presentation at the Scrum Australia conference in April. And part of what I'm going to do is present uh, industry data, sort of a state of the industry. Uh, from comparative agility by mining data. So that that's sort of the nature of it all. And it, once again, this is free for anybody. So if you want to take the survey, you just go to comparativeagility.com and you click on take the survey. And when you're done, you'll get your report. If you want to take it as a team, then you would contact me and I get you a special collector, a special URL where all team members take the survey through the same URL and then the system aggregates their data and you get a team report. So nice. Uh, enjoy it, and I hope you find it useful. That's cool. Comparativeagility.com. Beautiful. Well, thanks. I, I've actually personally taken the survey, and I find the data fascinating. And I really like that you put in the deviation, because it's one thing to score a four on average. It's another thing to see that your spread was, you know, <laughs> all over the place. So I find that uh, a, a very useful instrument. Yeah, once you get used to reading it, it's, uh, it's fairly easy to interpret your results. And then think of it as providing one set of input that uh, that coaches uh, that help the teams can use to, to help them decide where to focus next. Awesome. Cool. Where, well, where we'll focus next is we'll go to our, our next question I uh, had for you. You came uh, to visit us um, in our city and uh, talk to our user group about feature teams versus component teams. And I, I did enjoy that talk. I know everyone did. So I thought it might be worth having you um, give us a, a quick take on that. Oh, I appreciate that. Yes, this was at the... Uh, the Agile RTP meeting uh, mm -hmm. in Raleigh a few weeks ago. That's right. And uh, by the way, for people who are interested, uh, the slide presentation from that is also available uh, for download off the Innolution website. Uh, so if you want to go into the details, by all means, feel free. Uh, th this topic, uh, I offered this topic up and it, it was selected by the group to be a good discussion topic because so many different companies have to deal with this issue. And to make sure everybody's on the same page, we're talking about how do you scale up when you're working on an Agile development effort that requires more than a single team. You know, Agile at the single team level is rather straightforward, but you know, everybody has a pretty clear understanding of how to form that cross-functional Agile team and, and to have them work against their backlog to get the job done. But the situation becomes a bit more complex when you start looking at the fact that, well, I need 40 or 50 people or 100 or 500 people to actually work on something quite large, obviously the single team idea doesn't work. 
Mm -hmm. And the experience that I have is that most larger corporations tend to focus on component teams. And let's just make sure we're clear on what that is. Uh, A component team doesn't build a feature that an end customer would be able to consume. They work in an asset area, a a component area, perhaps an architectural layer or just a a component that's being built. You know, we work on the routing component for the GPSs. So our team does all the routing code. Uh, Customers don't buy routing code. Customers buy GPSs, but every GPS will have a routing in it. And so we know why companies do that, because they they want to have a conceptual integrity within that area. They trust a certain set of people to do the work in that component. And the goal would then be to farm the work out specifically to those people to do the work, because if they let someone who's not trusted in that area go in and mess with the code, well, uh, they could break a lot of things in ways that nobody could even predict. Mm -hmm. So the issue we run into is that there tends to be a preference for component teams because they, on the surface, have some uh, what apparently are good characteristics, the ability to reuse the component to build it in a consistent way. The the problem is that component teams also come with issues. There's no perfect solution here. There are only compromises. And so feature teams, which are an alternative, are composed of all the people necessary to build an end customer feature and get the job done. Now, normally, when we talk about agile development, we're thinking predominantly about feature teams, the idea that you have a team that works against the backlog, the backlog is populated with features that are actually meaningful to a customer. Mm -hmm. We pull the features, we get the job done, we deliver the features. So really what we focused on in Raleigh in that presentation was, you know, we don't want to buy into dogma, the idea that, you know, component teams bad, feature teams good. (laughs) <laughs> right, because yeah. there, there, a lot of times that's sort of the prevailing attitude. I would think a lot of times feature teams do, in fact, have superior economic characteristics that we want to look at. But you really have to drive the decision of what should your team structure be based on the economics of that approach, right? And I think what you'll find at, in large companies, they almost always end up with a blended model. They won't be a hundred percent either way. I think normally you'll find most organizations at scale should probably have most of their teams be feature teams, but occasionally the compo- a component team or two will make sense. Why? Because the economics of having a centralized team that does just that particular piece of work makes sense. And when you evaluate it against waste and you know, life cycle and you know, flow time through the system, you'll realize that that's not a bad trade-off to have made. But until you set up the structure, evaluate it for its economic characteristics, uh, it would just be a form of guessing. Mm -hmm. And it would certainly be unfortunate to just assume one approach is always superior to the other, given that we have a large diversity of teams out there, and they all scale in slightly different ways. So uh, this is a critical topic. I had a conversation today with a company. I'm going to go do coaching with them for two days in a few weeks, uh, and this is their predominant issue. Interesting. you know, and, and almost any time I speak with a large company, this topic comes up. So if you're, if you're in a large company, my guess is you're dealing with the issue of how do we scale and what is the right pattern for us. And, and you might be looking at the choices you've made and asking, were they good ones or weren't they? Uh, and so the Raleigh presentation was really focused on laying out a framework you could then use to evaluate whether you made good choices or maybe you want to reconsider some of them. Yeah, that's fascinating because you would think feature teams, but seeing there's cases where you want component teams is 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 interesting, and that's yeah, like you mentioned for your clients, sometimes a, a key pivotal issue. It, it is, and you know, if you're a small company, you don't sweat this issue. If you're a big company, my guess is it's something that you have to deal with every single day. Wow, that's fascinating. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, walk by here. There's a couple. Um, you just uh, the map. The reason I put the map here is. Um, uh, these are actually people that have been viewing our site, uh, just to make the point that we are rather distributed. Um, some of the other uh, tools I have in here are also good for distributed teams. So that's how we address that. Uh, I don't know who the guy is on that on that card or the. <laughs> pay no attention. <laughs> you know, and I wanted to thank uh, also Reaction Grid for uh, providing some of the tooling we're using for um, for today's talk. Right on. Um, yeah, <laughs> he's there. Okay, so uh, Agile Portfolio Management. I think that's an interesting trending uh, topic because I think that's important for enterprises. Um, uh, but well, what's up with that these days? Can you tell us something about that? 
Yeah, this one is uh, as critical to me as feature versus component team. So the picture that you're looking at up there, um, and I wouldn't have time to go through all of this, but what you're seeing up there are 11 strategies that I use for doing portfolio level management in an Agile-like way. Mm -hmm. um, anytime I go to a large company, uh, it's a guarantee that the way they do Agile, the way they, the way they do portfolio management is very likely not going to align well with downstream Agile development. And, and I think as everybody can imagine, this causes all kinds of problems. In a sense, it sounds like, yeah, 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 I'm going to let you guys downstream work in an Agile-like way, but we're still going to do everything up front in a very traditional phase-based sequential way of doing it, right, with a governance model that might actually look a bit like waterfall. And mm -hmm. obviously, that's a very large disconnect. And, and so I find, I'll make an observation. I haven't visited a company in the past decade uh, that doesn't suffer from the problem that they have too many projects started at the same time. Ah. Right? Now, if you're listening to this right now and watching what's going on, you're shaking your head like this at this point. Going, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that, down, that, yeah. That's my company, right? You know, <laughs> yeah, we work on so many different things and everybody's on so many different projects, we can't get anything done. And so really the, the 11 strategies I'm showing, three of them deal with how do you schedule. So you think of portfolio management as managing a portfolio backlog. You know, just like we would have a backlog for individual projects, an individual product, we would have a backlog for the portfolio, the, the, the set of work that we as an organization need to perform. And like any other backlog, that list has to be put into order. You know, which products or projects should we work on before which other ones? And so how you go about managing that list and the decisions you make when managing that list can significantly ec affect the economic outcome. So I list the you know, three strategies for how you schedule, you know, life cycle profits, cost of delay, accuracy, not precision. Four, for how you would actually put items into your portfolio, you know, having a sound economic filter, managing the rate at which things arrive, kind of want to match that with the rate things are leaving, uh, being able to deal with an emergent opportunity. What happens when you plan your portfolio and the next day some fantastic opportunity nobody ever conceived of presents itself? Hmm. Probably have to move on that quickly. In Agile, we favor smaller, more frequent releases, so the portfolio should reflect that. That's all in the inflow. You know, when do you start doing work? Well, in Agile, we always focus on the idle work, not the idle workers. Uh, most organization, here's most organizations' policy for how they will start work out of the portfolio. Start working on product A. Everybody 100% busy yet? Nope. Cool. Oh. So let's, start, let's start working on product B. Everybody 100% busy yet? No. You see the algorithm. They'll keep marching down their portfolio starting projects until they get everybody 100% busy. And they'll have like two developers that are like 95% occupied on five projects. You know what? Those guys have 5% available capacity. Let's go ahead and start the next project and they can spend 5% of their time on that. And everybody who's watching this knows that's a disaster. Mm -hmm. So in Agile, we don't worry about how busy we're keeping the workers. We worry about how smoothly the work is flowing across the system. So we start projects only to our capacity. So we need a WIP limit, which is the next item there. And uh, what does WIP stand for again? Oh, sorry, a WIP, a, a work in process limit. Mm -hmm. uh, simply stated, you know, as a, an organization, we have the ability, right? So the WIP, right? <laughs> we have the ability to only work on so many things at a time. Uh, here's the trick in Agile. The WIP limit is determined by the number of high-performance Agile teams you have, not by the number of developers or the number of QA people or UX people you have. The only WIP that matters in Agile is the ability you know, to put teams on a project or to work on these, uh, on these different products. So essentially what you do is you figure out how many high-performance Agile teams do we have and how many projects or products can they work on. And that's your limit. And when you hit the limit, you don't exceed it. You may not be sure what the limit is, and you might have to find it empirically, but you'll have a good idea based on the number of teams that you have. So that's we want to whip limit. And yeah. then it ties in with the last one on outflows, which is you never start a project in Agile without having a complete and engaged team. A partial Agile team does not a team make. Right? They're not a full team. They can't get the job done. So I would never start an Agile product you know, developing that product if I didn't have a full team. Yeah, I mean, if I needed three teams to work on that particular product and I had one complete team, then I have a complete unit and I might start the product with one team 
And when the other two became available, I'd roll them on. But mm -hmm. these are the kind of decisions that have to be made. And these are the strategies. And my experience has been most companies might do a couple of these. I, I've never met a company that does all 11. And, and this isn't a cafeteria. You don't get to pick and choose you know, which mm -hmm. ones you like and don't like. They self-reinforce. <clears throat> I mean, in the last one, marginal economics simply means you need to be prepared to fail fast. Because you, you have to deal with stuff that's already in flight. What if I've already started work? Just because I started working on a project doesn't mean I should finish it. Ah. If, if the economic situation changes and it's no longer sensible to finish the product, I should stop. Hmm. But a lot of people won't do that because they get, they get concerned about sunk cost. Uh, you know, I've already spent a million dollars on this thing. I know it's going to cost nine million more to finish it. And it's only going to now, I thought it was going to cost a million, now it's going to cost 10. Originally, I thought it was valuable to 100% of my customers. Now I, I learned it's only valuable to 10%. Oh. I mean, you know, then you're sitting there going, do I really want to finish this? I mean, the cost-benefit ratio on that changed by a factor of 100. Maybe we should kill it. Uh, but there are companies whose motto is in for a penny, in for a pound. Mm -hmm. and, and if you live by that creed, you'll never cancel a project. And then you don't have the fail-fast strategy. Fail fast, and if, if you don't like fail fast because some companies don't like the word failure in anything they do, fine. We'll agilize it. Uh, <laughs> learn quickly and adapt. <laughs> That's right. That's what I do. Right. <laughs> right. If you find out that you're working on something you shouldn't finish, stop working on it, right? But you know, that'll only work if you're willing to actually stop spending money after you spent the first dollar. So, you know, as I said, this is a deep topic, and uh, uh, I actually gave a 90-minute uh, presentation on this at the last Agile conference, the Agile 2012 conference in Dallas, and um, they were kind enough to actually videotape the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so cool. that video is on my website, on the Innolution website as well. Uh, or if you're so inclined, this is Chapter 16 of the Essential Scrum Book and all of, oh, its, uh, all of its glory. Yeah, thanks for the, the pointers to that, both the video on your website, um, I think it's Innolution.com, uh, and also your book, because um, I, I see that every day, people trying to maximize their research, utilization, which is dead wrong. You went in cycle time. And they don't have the concept of whip limits, work in progress. So it's fun. You know, I'm trying to just go through the interview here. I'm actually learning stuff as we're talking. So <laughs> cool. that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm getting yeah, my money's worth. <laughs> I got to tell you, if, um, if I was a senior executive at a company, portfolio management is one of the first things I would focus on. Uh, wow. there's, with very small changes here, you can get a huge return on investment. Um, but it requires people to actually be willing to apply agile principles when doing portfolio management. Interesting, interesting. Well, I know what, I'm going to go crack chapter 16 of your book then after the talk. Right on. Excellent. So uh, I also wanted to mention um, technical debt. Uh, so in the environment, I'll just walk over to our little um, uh, cue card and talk about technical debt. Um, that sounds interesting, but, but can you explain a little bit about what we mean by that? Yeah, technical debt is actually very interesting. So the, the issue here is that technical debt has become a, a sort of a catch-all term for all the bad things that plague software today. Uh, but really what it is, is it, it's, I mean, it could be bad design, defects. You know, we have huge manual testing debt, right? I mean, we have 2% test automation, so anytime we need to determine whether or not we changed something and it broke anything, it's a huge effort to manually retest the system. It's all this kind of stuff. And it turns out that, you know, even if no one's used the term technical debt before, everybody understands the concept. And the reason I like the term technical debt, which was coined by Warren Ward Cunningham, Hmm. Is that is the technical debt uh, is a metaphor that resonates with business people. Right? If I go to a business person and I say, yeah, the system we're building actually has a fair amount of technical debt in it, the instant analogy to financial debt is going to pop in their head. And, and there's a lot of benefits from that because then they can start asking questions. The most obvious is which is, well, I don't know, you know, financial debt has interest, payments that go with it. Do we pay interest on technical debt? And we're like, Every day. Big time. Right? I mean, every day we go into that code and we have to dance around all the shortcuts that are in that code. And it takes us a little bit more time to get the job done. That's the interest payment that we're paying, you know, paying on the technical debt that we have. And so I love the metaphor because it provides a framework for having a discussion between the technical team and the business team. And it allows that conversation to take place. And, and honestly, it's an important conversation for a number of reasons. First, 
Um, business is usually uninformed that the debt exists. If I go to a business person, I go, hey, what's your financial debt position? They're going to give me a pretty you know, good answer to that question. If I go to them and I say, uh, how much technical debt do you have in development? Uh, they're going to look at me and go, I don't, don't understand that. Uh, I mean, look at the balance sheet. There's no, there's no line item on my balance sheet for technical debt. You know, and I'm like, well, that's unfortunate because you have it. <laughs> and the magnitude of that could actually be quite high. Well, now they're going to go ask a question. Hey, guys, uh, what kind of debt position do we have in development? Ask any technical person where the technical debt is in their system. They will immediately point to the code. In fact, they know because they're the ones that put the skull and crossbones in the comment <laughs> in front of it. You know, don't go in here. You know, here be dragons, right? Uh -huh. you know, don't touch this code. Well, they know that's where the mess is. Now, then we work together to actually figure out how to get it out. Because people who say technical debt is a technical issue have missed the point. Technical debt can accrue for a variety of reasons. In fact, when I discuss technical debt, I actually break it into three categories. Right? They're, they're sort of um, you know, what I call naive technical debt. What I mean by naive technical debt is we made naive decisions. That could be done at a technical level, right? The people doing the work uh, are unfamiliar with good technical practices, and they just did things that, in hindsight, were foolish, mm -hmm. right? And it leads to a mess. But those same naive decisions could be made on the business side, right? I mean, I want all these features by that date. Uh, okay, that's not possible. Yeah, but I want all these features by that date. It's uh -huh. not possible, right? So what happens? Get it done. Well, that, that's sort of a license to accrue debt. The only way a team's because because throwing more bodies at the problem, adding more resources, is likely not going to solve the problem. So if you're not going to change the date, and you're not going to drop scope, and you're not going to add more people to it, there's only one more variable that you can flex, and that's going to be quality. Yeah, skip so all the tests and the pairing and the code reviews and. <laughs> Yeah, we won't design it quite the way we should have designed it, and we won't build it quite the way we should have built it. And, you know, coding it, wow, you know, it did the best job we can. Oh, automating those things? I mean, who's got time to do that when you're running with your hair on fire, right? You're not <laughs> right. going to do it. So you, so you have the naive debt. Um, you have a form of debt I'll call unavoidable. You know, unavoidable debt is just that. Uh, we have a system. Our system works reasonably well. Uh, we leverage a third-party component. We, we program to their API, and uh, they change the API. Oh. And our, our system stops working, and we've accrued debt. We did nothing wrong. Uh, I would suggest that that type of debt is unavoidable. Okay. You know, it's, it's nothing we did. I mean, you could say, well, you should have predicted they were going to change their API. I'm like, okay, yeah, but who would have guessed how, right? And you can't, you can't design defensively specifically for how their APIs may change when you don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, plus, our design would evolve, right? What happens when um, we start you know, designing today and two years from now, the design that worked really good two years from now doesn't quite meet the business needs today? Mm -hmm. All right, so, you, know, you could argue that's somewhat unavoidable. And then the third category of debt I refer to is strategic. And strategic debt um, is really where the business comes in fundamentally. Here's what I mean. Um, you could run the economic discussion and say, it is better for us to take on the debt to accelerate the product into the marketplace. You know, for example, if I took two months off the product and got it into the marketplace two months earlier, and those two months were worth $500,000 in additional sales, and the cost of taking on the debt appears to be about $100,000, meaning we'll spend $100,000 extra to have to take the debt out later if we didn't put, you know, you know, then if we didn't put it in to begin with, then you might look at it and go, I don't know, $500,000 in life cycle profits, $100,000 if I take on the debt. Hmm, maybe I should take on the debt. The problem with that, and, and uh, there are times when that is absolutely true and it is the correct decision to make. And when we accrue that kind of debt, we're accruing strategic debt. Strategic, okay. We, we knowingly took on the debt for strategic purposes. The problem in my experience, and I'm guessing yours as well, is that people don't correctly quantify the debt. They don't take into account all the facts. First of all, they're, they actually believe they're going to pay the debt back. And in a lot of cases, they never do. 
they never really do uh, you know, pay that debt back, or uh, they they're never as good. As I said they're never quite as good as they think they're going to be at doing it, or it takes much more time and money. So I would suggest strategic technical debt should only be accrued when you when you get to a point where you say, uh, like a startup company, you know we're running out of cash. If we don't get this product into the marketplace, we're going to die. Right. So yeah, a, a scenario I would call death before deployment. Yes. I've worked at seven startup companies. We were always close to running out of cash at some point. And at that point, you might look at it and go, it's worth the debt. Because if I try, if I work harder now to not put the debt in, I may not be around. It's like triage, right? Save the patient first, right? And you'll clean things up later. But I have to admit, those are far less frequent than people would assume. Interesting. So, technical, this is actually chapter eight of uh, the Essential Scrum book. And I always got a lot of questions for people. Why would you call out technical debt in a book that's called Essential Scrum. How is debt essential to Scrum? I'm like, I can't imagine how I would have written some of the later chapters if I couldn't have leveraged the concept of technical debt when having the discussion. Chapters like on technical, you know, dealt with technical practices and other things. Uh, in fact, I thought it was so important, I put it in the overall part of the book referred to as the core, you know, where all the core principles come up. I think it's that important. You have yeah. to understand your debt. You have to manage your debt, meaning you have to service your debt. And you know, I go in the book into all kinds of details on strategies for how on Agile projects you could go about servicing debt. A really interesting topic. Well, I really believe it because I feel that, you know, when I work on development teams, just you, know, you dread going to a certain file. It's like, oh, my gosh, are we, you know, we can't automate our coverage because of some of the code. Well, good. Well, thank you. Great yeah. topic. Uh, the last topic I wanted to kick around with you is um, more moving over to this one is um, scrum visibility and risk detection. I thought that was important, knowing some you know transparency is a key pillar of scrum. But I thought maybe you could give us some share some thoughts with us on that. Right. So um, transparency is the, the third leg on the on the three legged stool of empirical process. And what I mean by that, the other two are inspect and adapt. Mm -hmm. Well, how can you inspect and adapt? if you don't have transparent access to all the available information. I mean, we have to be able to have unrestricted access to the important information to know what is it that we want to do. You know, how do we want to change things? So without visibility, Scrum will fail. Right? If we're in an environment where information is hoarded and isn't shared, I've had this before. I went to this one company. I put up a slide once, and on the slide had words like you know, transparency, safety, you know, it was just like an environment where, you know, people could be free and open. People started laughing uh, in the class. I was like, I'm looking at the slides going, I didn't realize there was anything funny about that slide. And people are like, well, you can't assume any of that here. I'm like, why? I'm like, oh, you know, we do a force reduction, a layoff, about once a month. Wow. Nobody around here trusts anybody. Right? There's no trust. There's no safety. There's no transparency. Transparency? If I know the information and you don't, at the next riff, they're going to let you go and they're going to keep me. So <laughs> I'm looking at them going, uh, you're, you guys are going to have a really difficult time adopting Scrum in an environment where you can assume no trust, no safety, no transparency. So without the, the lack of visibility, huge risk, right? I, I would address that problem first. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I would address the safety issue and the trust issue first before I would try to adopt Agile, because I, I don't think you're going to be very successful. Yeah, at anything for that matter, probably. Uh, agreed. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, they, they clearly have a, a real issue, and I, I understand where those guys are coming from, but it's a real issue, and senior management at that company needs to stem the bleeding quickly. Wow. All right, well, now that's this interesting. Will, the risk thing here is fascinating to me, right? This. Um, I refer to the whole concept as uncertainty management. Mm -hmm. uh, the fellow who trained me in this was you know, an expert in uncertainty management. And the, the issue there, risk management is just one part of uncertainty management. It's, it's sort of the negative consequence side because on the positive side, you have, in a sense, windfalls. Right? I mean, on any given project, obviously, your goal is to identify the high risks, the ones, especially the ones that have a high risk and a high dollar impact if they actually come to be. But that's one side of the equation. The other side is, why don't I look for opportunities that I can leverage and exploit, right, so I can get windfalls? Um, but for the sake of our discussion, I'll focus on the risk side. But you know, keep in mind, from my perspective, that's just half of the umbrella, right? The other half is you know, covering opportunities. 
in, in, in Agile development, we are not out of the risk identification and mitigation business. Right? It is as critical to us as it is to anybody else who's building a product. And, and so the way I try to approach this is I try to identify the areas where I have the greatest degree of uncertainty. So in a sense, I'll, I'll create a matrix, a graph. The X dimension will be how, uh, what is the probability that the risk will occur? The Y dimension is what is the dollar impact if it happens? Mm -hmm. well, let, me, let me give you an example. Um, we outsource development to a third party for a particular component. We need their component to ship our product. Right, so now there's a risk. The risk is that the third party fails to deliver the component when they said they would deliver the component. And we're basing, we're, we're organizing our product backlog under the assumption that their component will show up at a certain point in time. So we sequence stories lower in the backlog because we can't work on them until we get their component. So first question we would ask is, what do you think the probability is the vendor will actually fail to deliver on the date they promised? You know, I say, oh, you know, I'm thinking it's like a 50% chance. Okay. What would be the dollar impact if they didn't? Well, if we don't get the component, we can't ship our product. Every month that we're out of the marketplace with our product is a million dollars in lost revenue. Okay. So I can now plot this on the XY coordinate plane, right, and say it's got a fairly high probability of occurrence, and it's got a fairly high impact if it does. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the ones that have a low probability. Oh, that's like a 5% chance that could happen, and if it did, it's a $2 impact. Okay, you can move on now, right? You're not going to waste any time thinking about mitigation. But the ones that are high dollar impact, high probability, that's the stuff that ought to keep you up late at night. Now, in Agile, our principal technique for how we deal with high, a high degree of uncertainty is we buy information, right? We create knowledge acquisition stories. So in our product backlog, we create a knowledge acquisition story. Now, knowledge acquisition goes by a number of different titles, prototype. Mm -hmm. Proof of concept, study, experiment, spike, choose your favorite term. They all mean the same thing to me, buy knowledge, right? So when presented with an uncertain situation, the mitigation action is frequently in Agile, buy knowledge. Step back and spend some money today to learn important information. And the economics of doing that are typically well justified because if you look at it, you'll say, that the cost of acquiring the knowledge is far less than the value of the knowledge that I get. Hmm. Right? So if it cost me one sprint to get the knowledge, and the sprint cost me $20,000 to do, but the knowledge can help me avoid an error that has a half million dollar impact. Wow. That, that was money well spent. I spent twenty k to avoid a much larger error. So when in doubt, buy a vowel. Step back, <laughs> buy some knowledge, right? So. Nice. It's not. It's risk detection and risk mitigation. And in Agile, we have a very simple way right, of dealing with a lot of these. Some of them require other types of product backlog items. Like in the case of my, our vendor might fail to deliver, I'd probably sit down with the team and I'd say, okay, we're at risk. What could we do to manage that risk? And, you know, and we'd have a number of strategies. One might be, well, maybe we should have one or two of our people go to the vendor, work with them a little bit, and see if we can't help accelerate things. Okay. Okay. The other might be what we would call the parallel head strategy. You know what? Uh, I'm really concerned that these guys will not get the job done. I'm going to spin up a team in our own company, give them a backlog, have them build it in parallel. The first team that gets it done wins. All right? So you could say, you know, we're going to be, obviously there's a cost. Every mitigation action has a cost, which you have to evaluate before you take it. Because if the cost of the mitigation is so expensive, it may not be worth taking the action. Wow. Right, so risk is, uh, I think every company has some process for dealing with risk, so that's the good news. Um, I don't think risk is well discussed in the Agile community. Uh, in, in Chapter 2, I'm sorry, Chapter 3 of the Essential Scrum book, when I lay out core principles, I discuss risk and its position and how to manage it. Because if you think about it, Scrum has this really cool ability to simultaneously reduce different forms of risk at the same time. Traditional waterfall style development, if you, if you define two forms of risk, there's, there's means uncertainty and there's ends uncertainty. Okay. Means uncertainty is how am I going to do it? Ends uncertainty is what am I going to end up with? What will the product look like? In, in waterfall, the strategy is 
eliminate 100% of the, the ends uncertainty first. Write the full requirements document up front of exactly 100% of everything you want to build. And then we eliminate means uncertainty, how we're going to go about building it. In Agile, we simultaneously reduce everything at the same time. Uh, it's meaning th that the curve isn't take one down and then do the other. It's more of a we simultaneously do both. Mm -hmm. And if you add into that customer uncertainty in Scrum, not only do we try to get you know, working assets every sprint, we try to get working validated assets every sprint. So key issue. Wow, that's great. Well, it just uh, whets my appetite to dig into a few more chapters. Um, so I'd like to hear more, but I'm going to have to, I guess, read the book because <laughs> we're going to we're going to go back to our uh, home base here and okay. uh, just kind of wrap it up. So I'm going to walk over, in fact, to the picture of your book, um, Essential Scrum. Um, uh, Kenny, I really enjoyed talking with you today. I like the small talk thing. I've actually seen some of these visual uh, venues. I've written a small talk, one called Turf. In fact, it's written originally in small talk. Uh, but you gave us a great uh, shotgun blast of all sorts of cool topics. So um, did you have any other thoughts before we wrap up? I, first, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. And I love being in the virtual world and, and walking around and seeing everything. So really well done. And, yeah, I would just say to folks that um, if you want more information, uh, check out the com website. And you can read about the book over there and other things. And I always, I'm always happy to answer email questions. So feel free to drop me an email. Awesome. Very good. Thanks so much, Kenny. And uh, thanks for the pointers. We'll go look up more information. Thank okay, you. Thanks, Bill. Have a great day.